good morning. My name is Nate, and I serve here as a husband, dad, and one of the pastors here at Grace, and I'm grateful that you're here, whether you're in the room or online. Um, several of you have mentioned this past week that there's a, there's a sense of God doing some really amazing things in and through our church. That he has done, is doing, and we pray by God's grace and God's mercy that he'll, he'll do in and through our church. To that end, I want to encourage you, like every business, corporation, restaurant that you've ever gone to in the last 20 years of your life and ever bought something and they sent you a text message and email to remind you that the end of year is coming, as if you didn't know that. I wanna remind you as well that uh, so often we give our lives and our allegiances and our time and our money to things that in the grand scheme of things aren't gonna impact eternity. I wanna encourage you to lean into your church, to lean into Graceland and to give because we believe that Jesus is gonna transform as he has, as he's doing, as he, we, we pray that he'll continue to do transform lives in the neighborhoods and the generations and the, and the nations. And so I wanna pray that you would give heartily, generously to your church, unashamedly. Jesus had a lot to say about that, so we're grateful. Um, hey, I wanna encourage, encourage you for everyone to do this, and, and here's, here's why. Um, there's, there's something mentally, psychologically that happens in our hearts when we look around and we see everybody doing something. So I'd like you to take your phone out, go ahead and take your phone out, because I know you got it with you, it's right there, it's probably in your hand. We're gonna be in Luke chapter two. I'd like you to pull up a text message. You, many of you know the number. We've said it so many times, 812-432-2234. Or uh, take the connect card in front of you because I think everybody has a next step today. I want everybody, I wanna appeal to you, even if you don't want to, maybe out of your love and deference for the person next to you, pull up a text message, 812-432-2234, or connect card. And I'd like you to put your name in the text or on the connect card, and I'd like you throughout this message to ask the Holy Spirit, what is my next step? The theme of this morning has been the faithfulness of God. The big idea is the faithfulness of God. I'm gonna talk a lot about that, but everybody there, whether you're a believer or not a believer, whether you've been to the church a long time or you're new or you're watching for the first time or you've come here uh, through an invitation, everybody has a next step. Maybe that's you need to come to faith in Jesus. We're gonna talk about this. There's no neutrality in this text. Maybe it's you need to become part of the faith family. Maybe you've been putting off baptism. It's not something you need to pray about. It's, it's actually an act of obedience. And Christians show Jesus that we love him by our obedience. Maybe you need to reconcile with a spouse or with a friend. Maybe you need to take the next step of actually being immersed in the Bible and reading the Bible. Maybe you need to be connected to a community group. So next step, 812-432-2334, or the connector. Write your name and say, maybe, Faith family, Jesus, I need to become a Christian, or I need to get baptized, or I've got questions about what it means to believe and follow Jesus. Whatever it is, I'd like it to, you can leave the connect card on the pew, or put it in the giving boxes, or take it to our guest services, first impressions. We'd love to give you a gift. You can turn it in there, or you can send that text message. Text message. Everybody, I wanna encourage you to do that, because I think as we look around, there are people who are new, and I think, I, I wanna take a next step but am I the only one? No, everybody every day of every week has a next step as we're believing and following after Jesus. We're in Luke chapter two, verses 22 through 40, and I asked this question on Facebook this past week and got a lot of answers. A lot of people commented publicly and a lot of people sent me private messages, and it was this. I never thought I'd see the day when. I never thought I'd see the day when I would have a child. People praying for a child, whether through adoption or uh, through biology, they, they, they've had a, had a child and they were waiting and praying for a child. I never thought I'd see the day when my spouse would come to faith in Jesus. Praise God for that. I never thought I'd see the day when my spouse thought their marital vows were optional. I never thought I'd see the day when I would bury a child or my spouse or a close friend. I never thought I'd see the day when I would become a Christian. There, there were a myriad of responses on and on, some encouraging, some discouraging, some serious, some snarky, but for the most part, all of us can fill in the blank. I never thought I'd see the day when. And when we come to Luke chapter two, what we see from Anna the prophetess 
and Simeon, they never thought that they would see the day when they would actually behold and their eyes would be laid upon salvation, the rescuer, light, truth. So if you have your Bibles, uh, whether it's on your phone or a hard copy of God's Word, I want to encourage you to stand with me as we read the Bible together. I'm going to read Luke chapter 2, verses 29 through 35, and I read out of the ESV just in case you're wondering, all right? Here's what God's word says to us, and at the end, there is that prompt. This is God's word to us, and if you see fit, we'll say together, thanks be to God. Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, God's faithfulness. For my eyes have seen your salvation. Jesus is a little boy at this time. That you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people of Israel. Verse 33. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. This is God's word to you and to me. And all of us said, thanks be to God. All right, you can be seated. In Luke 2, verses 21 through 24, we see not only were Mary and Joseph good godly parents, right? There's a lot there. I'm not gonna focus in on that, but I'll say this that your job as a parent or a grandparent or step-parent, as you have influence and leadership in your kids' or grandkids' lives, your job is not to raise them up and say, hey, I want you to choose what path you want. Obviously, they're moral agents. They have to make a decision, but we are to influence publicly, privately, outwardly, inwardly. We're to influence with our words and our actions and our lives and our allegiance that Christ is the truth and the way and the life, and you're to live and pursue him. Mary and Joseph were no exception. We see their commitment to God, and we see two more individuals who exemplify a commitment to God. They, they were waiting for God, and we see God's faithfulness. Big idea. The faithfulness of God is seen through and through in this text. We're introduced to Simeon and to Anna. Simeon is a man of character. He was righteous. He was godly. And he was waiting for the, the Lord's anointed, the Christ, the one who was set apart, the Messiah, uh, the anointed one who, who would uh, bring about, the Bible says, the consolation of Israel. We don't use the word consolation. It means comfort, that he'd bring redemption, that he'd bring salvation, that he would bring rescue. And Simeon is parked out at the local church, the local synagogue, and he's waiting for the Lord's Messiah, and he's waiting patiently. Unbelievably, uh, he's been waiting for years. Now, a lot of people will say, I, I don't know if I could do that. I don't know if I could be like Simeon. I don't have the patience. Have you ever said that? I don't have the patience. What you're saying is, I'm just choosing to be impatient. Well, I don't have the kindness. I don't have the gentleness. Well, if you're a believer in Jesus, you actually have a reservoir of unlimited grace to enable you to be patient and kind and gentle. Simeon was told by way of the Spirit of God that he will not see death until he lays his eyes on the Lord's anointed, the Messiah. One author said that these verses tell a story of a servant who is instructed by his master to keep watch through the long, dark night on a high place to wait for the rising of a special star and then to announce it to whoever is listening. After many wearisome hours of waiting, he at last sees the star in all of its brightness. He announces it and then he is discharged from keeping watch any longer. Simeon is charged with watching and waiting for the star of salvation, for the anointed one, for the Messiah, for the coming of God's Son. And finally, his eyes are fixed on God's salvation. Jesus, he sees him. I never thought I'd see the day when I would see the Lord's salvation. Now, this Jesus is a little boy at this time. Right? He, he's had a miraculous birth. He's already living a miraculous life. But we need to remind ourselves that no one is saved by the birth of Jesus. Right? There's a life to be lived. 
a cross that Jesus has to go to and eventually a resurrection will take place. But we need to remember, it wasn't just that Jesus provided salvation, that he provided rescue, that he provided the forgiveness of sins. That's true, but he embodies salvation. If you wanna know what salvation is, look to Jesus. If you wanna know what rescue is, look to Jesus. He is the light and the truth embodied. And there is a heavy truth in this text. Simeon was ready to die because he had seen the faithfulness of God and he had seen Jesus. We're not told how old Simeon was. He was undoubtedly an old man. But he said, I'm, I'm ready to die. I'm ready to go in peace. Essentially, he is saying, Lord, you can take me now. My work is done. I've seen your faithfulness. You've kept your word. I wanna say this, I mentioned this just a moment ago, there really is no neutrality with Jesus for those of you who are watching online and for those of you who are in the room. You're either a believer in Jesus or you're not. There's, there's no neutrality. I know there's people who have questions and there's doubts and there's hangups and there's skepticism and they're thinking through things and we want this to be increasingly more and more a safe place where people can ask questions but I, wanna, I just wanna lean in for a moment. You're not ready to die if you've not seen Jesus. You're not ready to die if you've not surrendered and yielded your life to Jesus. You're not ready to meet your maker because you've not bended your knee to your maker. To see Jesus is to be ready to die. It will take all of us. Hebrews 9, 27, for there is a time appointed for men, women, boys, and girls to die and then to face Judgment, the truth and reality for believers that judgment has been taken upon Jesus and the judgment is not ours. There's no condemnation, judgment for those that are in preposition in Jesus. To see Jesus is to be ready to die. Simeon says, I'm ready to die. And I'm not talking about uh, in this little sense, I've, I've gone to church and, and I've kind of dabbled in Christianity. Has Jesus transformed your life? Transformation is evident. Transformation is evident. This baby that Simeon was worshiping, he declared, is the Christ, is not only for the people of Israel, but for the whole world. Look at what, what uh, we read in verses 31 through 32. That you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles, non-Jews, and for glory to your people, Israel. That's why he has come, that we go to not only Israel, but to Gentiles. We go to the nations, we go to the generations, we go to the neighborhoods. And Mary and Joseph respond to verse 33, and they marveled, and they are amazed. And we've seen through Luke chapter 1 and through Luke chapter 2, the arrival of the king and the angels singing about this glorious king and, and how he's God and, and how he's Lord and how he's going to bring peace to people. But then Simeon seems to raid on their proverbial parade a little bit. He speaks some ominous or some discouraging words regarding Jesus. Jesus is the light of the world. We see that in Psalm 43. David writes, send out your light, send out your truth. But Jesus is the kind of light that exposes sin. And when he exposes people's inner working of their life, for many people, they don't like that, and they will oppose him. And the opposition is going to be violent, Simeon says to Mary and Joseph. So as much joy and love and celebration that Jesus has brought and he brings, there's going to come a time uh, when circumstances materialize that there's going to be a crucifixion and there's going to be grief that's going to be excruciating in the life of Jesus and it's going to be almost seemingly unbearable for Mary as he's rejected and mocked and despised and eventually stabbed in the side with a sword and she's going to remember that Simeon said this would happen and she's, then she's going to come to understand God has always had a plan for her son. And now this salvation that Simeon speaks about, this rescue isn't for everyone. It could be for you. It may not be. How do we know? Have you come to believe it? For God so loved the world, and yet we have to make a decision to believe and trust and follow after Jesus. Look at what he says in verse 35. So that the thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. What does Jesus do? He, unlike anyone else, exposes what's in our hearts. At the mention of Jesus' name, people are confronted with this truth. 
truths and in studying the person and the work and the message of Jesus, if we're honest with ourselves, he exposes pursuits and ambitions and desires that we know in our heart are not only unhelpful, but at times they are sinful. And I want you to be attentive just for a moment because attentiveness leads to awareness, which leads to worship. If we are attentive to what's going on in the inner workings of our heart, we will become increasingly spiritually aware and it will move us to worship, which you are created to be a worshiper of God. God's created you to worship him, not just in music, but all of your life is meant to love God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. We need to be attentive to our hearts right now because it leads to spiritual awareness, which leads to us understanding we've been worshiping all sorts of things other than God. We want to worship God, and if we see Jesus for who he really is, then we will see ourselves for who we really are, and we'll see our need for grace and mercy, and we will be drawn to Jesus. In fact, the word Simeon uses for rising there in verse 34 is used in other passages in the New Testament to speak about resurrection. Everyone who believes in Jesus will resurrect and rise to heaven, so to speak, right? Jesus was not sent to heal wounded people, as one writer said. He was not sent to wake up people who are asleep or give advice to confuse people or to exhort lazy people or to compel or inspire bored people or to educate ignorant people. Jesus came to raise dead people to spiritual life. That's why he came. And we see the faithfulness of God. And Simeon says, I can now depart in peace because my eyes have fixed their eyes upon the rescuer, the messenger, Jesus. But that's not for everyone in this room. In the sense of, have you come to yield your life to Jesus? Many people stand opposed to Jesus. They're intrigued by his teaching, but they don't like his followers and they don't like the church. I can understand that at times because we're not always the most gracious, kind people. We get in the way at times. Some people stand proud and defiant that anyone would say they're a sinner or can't save themselves. Simeon's words are prophetic and spot on. Jesus came to reveal the true nature of our heart. And there is in every single person's heart an opposition and a disdain and a rejection for the truth that Jesus embodies. Jesus embodies truth and light, and God sees us in our opposition. He sees us in our rebellion. He sees us in our struggles. He sees us in our sin, and he moves towards us. The cross of Jesus says he's committed to you and he's committed to me. And so belief communicates that we believe and trust and follow this person, but unbelief and sin communicates that we don't believe and trust and want to follow after this person. Attentiveness leads to awareness, which leads to worship. Connect card, your name, a text message, 812-432-2334. What step do you need to take? I, oh, I see God's faithfulness, I'm a believer, but I need to take steps to be faithful. The mark of a Christian is that we would be known by our love, and love is manifested in obedience. We're to be obedient people. What step do you need to take, brother or sister in Christ? What step is that? We move from Simeon to Anna. Anna was a prophetess. She's also awaiting the salvation of God that God would promise and that God would bring. And she had a very privileged calling and role. She knew and proclaimed God's will for his people. In the Old Testament, there's only seven prophetesses. So this is a rarity and one that speaks of her character. She is a widow, a woman advanced in years. She was married. And then only after seven years, her husband passed away. And then she gave the rest of her life to serving God. And despite the hardship and the difficulty of her life, losing her husband, despite the season of life and all the, all the difficulties that she had, she followed and honored God with her life. God always wants us to worship and follow and obey him regardless of the seasons of life, young and old, empty nesters and full nesters. In school, out of school, married, single, he wants our undivided praise and pursuit. And what does Anna do? She gives thanks for Jesus and begins to speak about Jesus to others. She acknowledged her rescuer and she understood that he was the salvation that God had sent. And she was grateful. She saw the faithfulness of God 
manifested before her very eyes. God is faithful. He's faithful to his promises. And as we think about Simeon and Anna, I want to share just a couple concluding thoughts. They see Jesus for who he is. They see Jesus for who he is. But here's where our perspective is a little different than theirs. We see Jesus even more clearly than they do, or at least we should. J.C. Ryle said this, if they, Simeon and Anna, with so few helps and with so many discouragements, live such a life of faith, how much more ought should we with a finished Bible and a full gospel? He says, let us strive like them to walk by faith and to look forward. They saw the faithfulness of God. Have you seen it? Have you experienced it? Have you received it? Have you surrendered to it? Have you yielded to it? Are you living your life pursuing and loving and striving after God? And what Luke is doing in this passage, what Luke is doing in this passage is drawing you and me in. He's drawing the reader in. He wants to draw every reader of this passage in to the story, whatever stage you're in, however old you are or however young you are, if you're new to the faith or old to the faith, if you're a seasoned Christian or just trying to figure things out, if you came from a religious background or an irreligious background, if you've always had a soft heart for the things of God or maybe you have a hard heart for the things of God, no matter where you are, no matter where you are in your spiritual life, the story of Jesus, his miraculous birth, his miraculous life, his death, the empty tomb, and his victorious resurrection, that story of hope can be yours. I never thought I'd see the day when. You know, I don't know about you, but when I read the Bible at times, I don't read it with the emotion that I know that I should. You know what I mean by that? Like I read it and I, it kind of becomes cursory and, and I become familiar with the truth of Jesus, and it does not move me. I want to share with you something I read this past week, and I want the Holy Spirit, I'm praying, Holy Spirit, as, as you hear prayer, and you answer prayer, and you deliver by prayer, I pray right now, Holy Spirit, that you would move in our hearts to help us see that Jesus is here, he's come, the faithfulness of God has been manifested in Jesus. This past week, I was, I was reading Revelation 4 and 5, and John, the Apostle John, has a similar situation where I never thought I'd see the day when. Revelation 4 is uh, this, this symbolism that speaks about the throne room of God. It's speaking about the, the almighty, the, the, the powerful, the transcendent, the sovereign uh, power of God, his presence, his perfection, his righteousness. And there's these these created beings, these heavenly beings that are flying around and they bend down and they veil their faces because he's so holy and he's so mighty, they cannot even look upon God. And there is this scroll in his right hand. And this heavenly being, this incredibly powerful heavenly being launches into an inquiry. Who is worthy to open the seal. This, the scroll uh, stands for all the purposes of God's plans of redemption and judgment. Who, what agent can approach this holy, terrifying, reverential, mighty, powerful, sovereign God? Who can approach God and, and unseal the seal so that God's purposes and plans and details of redemption, salvation and rescue and judgment can actually be manifested? And the angel launches into this inquiry and no one is there. And John, the Bible says in John 5, begins to weep. He begins to cry. Who is going to come and open up the scroll so that God's purposes can be manifested? And then an elder comes to John and says, hey, there is the Lion of Judah. 
the Lamb of God, not two different animals, one and the same, the line of Judah, all throughout the Bible, there's this prophecy that the Messiah is gonna come from the tribe of Judah, and we see this courageous, this ferocious lion. He, he's not safe, but he's good, and we have this line of Judah, and we have the lamb that was slain before foundations of the word, and John shouts out in joy, and he proclaims this in Revelation chapter five, verses 12, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. When we read the Bible, we need to understand Jesus has come. He is the one who opens the scroll, who opens the scroll and all the plans and details and purposes of the Father's plans of salvation and judgment and rescue and deliverance and redemption and judgment are seen in the person of Jesus. If you're a believer, you've received that. Does that not move you to want to worship Jesus? Does that not move you to want to raise your hands? Sometimes you just can't keep them by your legs. You just want to raise your hands to worship God and all that he does. But for many of you, you've not come to that reality. And there's a lot of people in the room. There's a lot of people watching online. Wouldn't it be great today if somebody said, I want to yield my life. I want to believe and trust in Jesus. If you're a believer, you got a next step. Some of you have been jacking around for a long time. You got to get serious about believing and following after Jesus because he's the king of the universe. And nothing short of every facet of our being is being yielded. And so if some of you need to come to the steps, you need to pray. You need to confess, I've not been following you. This is not shame, guilt. This is an opportunity. Repentance is a gift that we would recalibrate our lives to what we need to be. Some of you need to be part of our faith family. Some of you need to come to Christ. Some of you need to reconcile. There's all sorts of decisions going on right now in your hearts through the power and the work and the presence of the Holy Spirit. So I'm gonna pray, and I'm gonna get out of the way. We're gonna stand and sing, and I, I don't want you to hesitate. I want you to send the text message, here's my next step. I want you to write it out, and maybe you need to come forward to talk to someone and say, I, I wanna get my heart right. I wanna pray, I wanna commit. And Jesus always stands willing, always stands willing, all right? Father, we're thankful for your faithfulness. Gosh, we're so thankful. We confess to you at times that so many times we are unfaithful, and yet you are not like us. Would you see fit, Holy Spirit, to work in our lives Today is the day of salvation. Would someone come to faith in Christ? Would somebody take a step towards reconciliation? Would somebody take a step towards following after you with more obedience and love? Would somebody find freedom in being enslaved to a particular sin? Holy Spirit, all of us have a next step. Would you work in our lives in the next several minutes May fruit, may work, may steps be taken. We pray this with expectancy. In Christ's name I pray, amen.